showtime. Everyone, welcome to the Rosie and Bill show. Tonight, our guest has been performing for decades. He's an incredibly versatile singer who literally uses his voice to help people. Please welcome to the Rosie and Bill show, Long Island's Frank Sinatra, Sal Manzo. Sal! <laughs> that was one of the best introductions of my singing career. <laughs> and well, when you said... When, when you said I was singing for decades, my whole body trembled. <laughs> I can't believe I'm around for decades. Well, you know, two decades. More than one decade is decades. Well, I, only, you know. I only wish. You know. Well, Sal, I have to tell you, uh, you know, you just mentioned uh, that introduction that Rosie gave for you. She has been singing your praises for a long time. And as you and I both know, she can sing. So I have to ask. Where'd you guys meet? Actually, a very nice story. This is going back a while now, right, Rosie? It's got to be. Yeah. It's got to be fifteen years ago, I would say. Uh, uh, I was I was singing uh, I was singing at a private event uh, at a restaurant called Carmines in the theater district. Um. And uh, Rosie, who I didn't know at the time, obviously was a waitress at that time at the restaurant. So. Uh, being that, let's, I mean, let's face the facts. Rosie's a good-looking girl. <laughs> so I'm not a dummy. I'm certainly not a dummy. So we started talking, and it was nice to know that she said she was an actress and that she was a singer. And uh, so obviously we had something in common, and we struck up a conversation, and we've been friends ever since. Yeah, and on top of that, I want to add to this. First of all, it was such a pleasant surprise for me because we don't have music at Carmine's. They, they have a, you know, stuff on a CD that rotates and, and, and they did play Sinatra, they did play good music, but when you work there for a number of years, you kind of get tired of the same old thing. And then here's this live singer that comes in and he was fantastic. We were upstairs, it was a private party for the most part. and people would get up and dance. Like Sal really knows how to get people moving and engaged. And so, yeah, we had a lot of fun and it was so nice and he can really sing as I alluded to in my intro. But on top of that, Sal is actually the one who introduced me to the girls of Trey Bella. He's the one that said, hey, these girls are looking for a replacement. One of the girls left the group. I think you'd be a good fit. And the rest of history, that's right. The rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, still going. Um, you, you know, the nicest thing about Carmine's up, up until the pandemic hit, up until the pandemic, I think I was the only person they recommended as an entertainer if somebody wanted an entertainer or a singer. Up until the pandemic hit, I believe I really that, that I'm the one that they would recommend before anybody else. So... That was very nice of them to think of me in that way. Yeah, I don't remember really them having other people. There was a couple of other times where people who were part of a group might entertain, but nothing like what you did. So yeah, so that was definitely an honor and well and a well-deserved honor. So in the intro, Sal, we talked about Sinatra. Mm -hmm. Now I know he's had a great influence on you, do you remember the first time you heard Frank Sinatra? And, and what song was it? Do you remember? Well, I'll tell you this. From the time I was a little boy, uh, I mean, a little boy, like three, four years old, I was able to sing. And, and sing well, actually. And, and I never had a, till this day, I'm 58 years old, I've never taken a vocal or a music lesson in my life. But I knew from the time I was a very young boy that it was going to be a part of my life. And... The music, like Sinatra and Dean Martin and Jerry Vale and Jimmy Roselli, Frankie Valli, this is all the music that my family would listen to. So I was acclimated to that at an early age. 
And even as I got older and I started into my teens, I never listened to rock and roll. When everyone, all my friends were listening to that stuff, I just never liked it. So I was always, always on that, that, that Sinatra vein. That type of stuff always appealed to me. And, and that's how I got into that at an early age. And also, when I, uh, to, to tell you what song I heard first, I couldn't even remember. But um, it was October of 1974. So I was 12 years old. And that was the night that Sinatra did Madison Square Garden, his return concert after being retired for a few years. It's a famous concert now. Howard Cosell did the intro. Howard Cosell, it's a very famous intro. So we were all glued to this TV set because that was like, that was around the world that concert was on TV at that time. So, and I remember sitting there with my family. I remember it vividly. And me watching Sinatra do his thing and everybody talking about him and how great he is, especially if you come from an Italian American background, there's even more to that. There's a lot of pride. Right. So, um, so I remember to this day that particular concert, and I knew that's what I wanted to do. I knew it. And um, and I just didn't know at that time how how it was gonna come about. But I gotta say I'm 58 and you know I've been singing pretty much pretty much my whole life now. See, I can't believe it. Decades, as you said before. <laughs> Well, well, I did meet Sinatra when I was an, when I was a younger guy. Really? I we met him. Here. What happened? Okay, I'm going to tell this as nicely as I can. Uh, I was in my early 20s, and at that time, I fronted my own wedding band because back then, uh, I was in the wedding business. So I had I used to go out with like a ten piece band at that time, and um, I was home at my friend's house one day in Long Island. And his father walked in the door and said, I got a surprise for the two of you. We're going to see Sinatra next week. Now, my friend's father was a high roller. And Sinatra was playing the Golden Nugget in Atlantic City, which used to be run by Steve Wynn at that time. So the limousine picks us up in Long Island to take us to Atlantic City, New Jersey, to the hotel. So we're in the limousine. We're on the way to the hotel. And when we get to the hotel, you know the weekend's going to be pretty good when Steve Wynn is waiting to say hello. Which he was there to say hello to my friend's father when he got out of the limousine. So in turn, I met him just because I was with him. So that was like the coolest thing ever. So we get into the hotel, we check in, we go upstairs. And back then, you went to see Sinatra, always a suit and tie. Always. So we, we went upstairs to get dressed. And we come downstairs to the showroom and there's Steve Wynn again, waiting for us with, with like some security. And there was three other gentlemen that were meeting up with us to go into the show. Now, they waited for the lights to go down and all the people to go in before we were escorted in the show. This was, this was like a scene out of, out, of, out of Goodfellas. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so we get escorted into the center booth of the showroom. We sit down. Sinatra comes on. He starts doing his thing. Now, I saw Sinatra 19 times in concert in my life, 19 times. So in between most of his shows, um, he would say hello to everybody, lift up his drink and say hello. So he lifts up his drink and he says, hello, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to my show here at the Golden Nugget and to my paisans in the center booth. A salute and chantan. That was us. That was us. So my, my shoulders, I was like that. I sat up in the <laughs> and at the end of the show, we walk outside, and my friend's father, I'll never forget it, smiles and said, that was pretty good, huh? That was pretty good. He said hello to us and everything. I says, it doesn't get better than that. He says, it's going to get a little better now. Steve Wynn meets up with us again. He brings us to a private part of the hotel at the Golden Nugget. We open the door, and at the bar, it was a private bar, there's Sinatra at the bar right after the show. In his tux with his orange hanky, because orange was his favorite color. Jack Daniels, it was like a, it's, it's a picture that will never leave my mind. The Jack Daniels on the bar, he walks in, he 
he says hello to all the gentlemen. And me and my friend were standing there. And my friend's father says, Frank, can you do me a favor? Can you talk to this kid for a minute? Um, he's a singer himself. He like he, he's a, he's your biggest fan. Yeah, he says, and see Sinatra. Yeah, you like me, huh? I said, yeah, Mr. Sinatra, I think you're pretty good. He says, let me ask you a question. What's your name? I told him my name. He goes, what kind of stuff you sing? I said, well, Mr. Sinatra, I sing a lot of your stuff. And he goes, really, huh? Where do you do that? I said, I'm in a wedding business. I sing, I, I, front, I front my own band. He says, very good. He says, three things I don't ever want you to uh, uh, forget. Always do your best, never do drugs, and never stop learning. Those things came from Sinatra's mouth. Then he shook my hand. I didn't take a shower for a month after he shook my hand. <laughs> and uh, myself and my friend, we had to leave at that point, and then the gentlemen stayed there together. And, and how then, old were you, Sal? I was 21, 22. Oh. And uh, years later, at Patsy's, when I performed for the Sinatra family for the first time at Patsy's upstairs, I got to tell Nancy Sinatra that story. And she had tears in her eyes because she knew I wasn't making it up when I told the story and I mentioned the certain gentlemen that were there. She knew I wasn't making it up. She had tears in her eyes. So well, I imagine that he told his children the same thing, he t those three things. Don't you think? I, well, I'm, I'm sure he had. I'm sure he has. And, and I remember years later seeing him, seeing him in concert at Carnegie Hall. I was in the audience and uh, somebody from the audience yelled out, love you, Frankie, you're the best. And he said to the guy, I'll never forget it. He says, Pally, thank you, but I'm not the best because when you're the best, you stop learning. I'll never stop learning. That was from his mouth. And I, and I, and, and I smiled because I remember what he told me that time when we you know, great stuff. Great stuff. Oh my gosh, that's such an amazing story. And I and 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 then I sang for the Sinatra family th uh, three times in, in my life after Sinatra was gone. I sang for them in Atlantic City, and I sang for them at Patsy's. I was going to say, I think it's safe to say that if you were to create a musical Mount Rushmore, I'm pretty sure that one of the four faces on that uh, face of that mountain would be Frank Sinatra. I can give you the other three, too. Yeah, I was going to say, who, who might be the other three? Well, I, I look at it this way. Over the, let's say, the past hundred years. Now, I'm, we're talking about strictly from an artistic point of view. Mm -hmm. Whatever they did in their private lives, unfortunately, whatever is unfortunate or not, it is. But I'm talking strictly from an artistic point of view. I look at it, there's four pop icons. Sinatra was first. Elvis was second. The Beatles were third, and Michael Jackson was the fourth. Those I consider the Mount Rushmore of pop icons. Those are the four. And, and again, I'm not talking about their private life. Unfortunately, some things went wrong right. you know, along the way with, with certain people. But I'm talking from, from an artistic point of view, those were the ones. And if you really look back, you know, Elvis was loved, was loved, was loved, worth more dead than alive. The Beatles, the same thing. But if you look at it, Sinatra withstood the test of time better than them all. He really did. So there's a lot, a lot to be said about that. And besides that, Sinatra was an accomplished actor. Accomplished. So there's a lot there that he left us, which is a blessing. And I hope, like, like Beethoven is not forgotten from hundreds of years ago, I hope in another 150 years that they still know who Sinatra is. I hope I'm praying. I hope I'm praying that. You know, Sal, I was going to ask you what it is that you think sets Sinatra apart, but I think you just answered it. And you're absolutely right with, with the acting. I still remember a scene at the end of Von Ryan's Express when he's running for that train. Yeah. Um, just powerful, powerful stuff. He, he won the award. He won the Academy Award from a hero eternity, but the part he played as a junkie and the man with the golden arm, I think was his best performance ever. Really. Yeah, a lot of them. That's pretty amazing. Uh, Sal, don't you have some kind of tattoo in his honor? Some kind of tattoo? I got some kind of tattoo. There he is. <laughs> wow. I've got the world on a string. Is that what it is? That's what it is. That's what it says. Wow. 
I love that. That's great. During the pandemic. Okay. Let's, let's go back just to five, six months, right? Yeah. The, the virus hits the stay in places in, in enforced and everyone's quarantining. I turn on the computer, I go on Facebook and there you are on Facebook live singing. I'm mm -hmm. like, Oh, what's this about? And then I see that you're not, you know, this has a much higher purpose. So please tell everyone that story because Sal wasn't, he wasn't uh, not conforming to the stay in place. He actually had a much higher purpose in mind. So Sal, tell us about that. Well, what happened was when, when, when the pandemic hit and everything was shut down, um, I was sitting in, in my friend's restaurant at the time and, and I was talking to him and I said, even though things are bad right now for everyone, I have a captive audience around the world. Everybody around the world is in their home. They're either on the internet or they're watching Netflix. Okay? So I'm going to go live, Joe, every night of the week. For an hour or a night, I said, we're going to grab thousands of followers. How could we not? So... Then he says to me, I got an idea. Being that we're right across the street from the hospital and everything's going crazy there, why don't you see if we can get some donations uh, from the people that are watching you? And in turn, then we'll, we'll, we'll take that money, buy the food, and serve free meals to all the frontline workers over at the hospital, which is across the street. Great idea. So because of that reason, instead of doing it from home, I did it from the restaurant. But at that time, there was no body in the restaurant. It was just the, the, the staff and me singing. And, and, and people were allowed to pick up their food and leave or have it delivered. So we started, never expecting what was gonna happen. Love will never do what you want it to. Why can't this crazy love be more? So it caught, it caught wind. I started every night in the restaurant. I did at one point from the beginning of the thing that we started to, I did 58 straight nights of singing, 58 straight nights of singing. Wow. And, and I have a friend looking, I, he's trying to find this out. I said, that's gotta be some sort of a record. Call the Guinness Book of World Rec Records. I'm just curious to know. I want to know a singer. I don't care, famous, not famous. I don't care where they are. That anybody that sang 58 nights in a row. So, in two and a half months or so, I wound up raising twenty-eight thousand dollars from all the um, from all the people that called in, and and I have developed now thousands of followers around the world because of it. And I get thanks literally every day. I get a message, I get something. And uh, it, was, it was very heartfelt because I was singing at the restaurant and, and, and I'm promoting myself, I'm promoting the restaurant, what we're doing. Um, I started getting gifts from all over the world sent to the restaurant for me. Flowers, candy, thanking me for what I'm doing. I had, most days I had tears in my eyes, really. So. So that's what we did, and it turns out to be something special. Now, as of October, we're in Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And just by coincidence, I made a deal with a, a, a new restaurant. The restaurant's called La Piazza in Melville, Long Island. Okay? I'm going to sing live on Facebook from La Piazza Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. And we're going to promote Breast Cancer Awareness Month uh, and a dear friend of mine, Donna Chiaffi, she's a breast cancer survivor. She, has, she started an organization some years ago called First Company Pink, which is a breast cancer organization. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus in on her organization as I sing Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every week in October at La Piazza. And um, La Piazza is donating... For the month of October, anybody comes in and buys a gift card from 15% uh, for the month of anybody who buys a gift card 
goes towards a breast, uh, breast cancer awareness through First Company Pink. It'll be from the beginning of October, all through the month of October, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And, um, and you, you, you know, when you finally see me on the show, you, people can pick it up and, 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 and tune in to see me. Right. And yeah, there, there'll still be time left in October to see you. Sal, that's fantastic. I mean, you are just very philanthropic, whether you see it that way or not. You're, you don't, it doesn't, what I know of you is that you don't think anything of it. No, no, no. It's just who you are. It's just, uh, right. In other words, I just, very simply, you got to do what you got to do. That's it. That's it. And I don't look back. I do what I have to do. I do it. There's not, I wouldn't do it any other way. Can't. I'm not built that way. So um, I think we'll be okay. This month, uh, 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 I hope we generate a lot of awareness uh, and, and what, what they say from First Company Pink, more than awareness, they want action. They want to make sure that the women go out and get checked and do what they have to do, not just wait for something bad to happen. Go out, get it done. More than awareness, First Company Pink wants action. That's what they're about. You know, I'm really glad you said that because with a lot of great causes, you'll hear about awareness, awareness. And I think people are aware. But if you don't take that action or, or take those measures, being aware is not going to take care of things. But taking that action, getting checked, doing things, that makes all the difference. You're right, Bill, and that's their motto. Well, that's a really, really worthy cause. And, and we wish them all the luck in what they're trying to do and commend you, Sal, for what you're trying to do. We're going to take a quick break because we have a segment called 60 Seconds with Coach Lombardi. So What's that? that? What is that? She is a fitness expert and nutrition expert as well. And so she gives tips. We have a little segment on the show. Oh, you don't want me off of that one. <laughs> hey, you I never know what you can I learn. I got a cheeseburger from McDonald's. You don't want me in that segment. <laughs> More with Sal when we come back. and Bill. What a fantastic interview. I almost don't even want to give you a tip today because I want to get right back to it, but I am. So hey everybody, Coach Lombardi here. Today I want to talk to you about what I call training mix-up. I often see people getting stuck in a weight training routine, you know, doing the same thing day in and day out. And if you're too focused on one modality, you're doing your body a disservice. It's always best to give your body some training variety. This way, you'll recruit different energy systems and give your muscles the opportunity to be used in different ways. Now, because we will still be in quarantine at the time this tip is posted, you can do most of these things inside your home or by watching free online classes. So here's an example of what a week would look like. Monday, weight training, full body. Tuesday, yoga. Wednesday, trail hiking or beach walking in the sand. Thursday, a martial arts class. Friday, circuit with weights, Saturday, a dance or bar class, and Sunday, a bike ride, preferably outdoor, but indoors okay. So try this and let us know how you feel. And remember, you can always send questions to me at the email address below. I'm Coach Lombardi for the Rosie and Bill Show. See you next time. Another great tip from Coach, as always, and we are looking forward to see what she has for us next week. Sal, are you ready to have a little fun? I can handle it. I can handle it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. You know, with the whole pandemic, I, I don't feel like I've had as much fun as I want to have. So we're going to have a little fun. All right. right. We're going to play a little game with you. Uh, we're going to give you some lyrics from different Sinatra songs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so we're going to have see if you can name the song and then sing a couple lines from the song. How about that? <laughs> Sounds good. Sure. Okay. All right. Are you ready? Go. And this is, you know, this is going to be really easy because, <laughs> you know, it's Sinatra. All right. Here we go. We strolled the golden sand. To sweethearts and the summer wind. <laughs> Come on. Too easy. Too oh, easy. Well, they're all easy. That's the thing. All right. I got one. I got my glasses on for this one. Make sure I, I get it right. 
Don't you know, little fool, you can never win. Wake up to reality. Each time I do, just the thought of you makes me stop. Before I begin, I've got you under my skin. Yay. Impressive. <laughs> yes, of course. I knew he would know all these. See, this is really our way of getting you to sing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay. Just my arm. All you got to do is ask. No problem. I, I know. I know. Okay. Here's another one. Um, I know the routine. Put another quarter in the machine. Make it one for my baby and one more for the road. The long, long road. That's right. One for my baby. He knows it. He's got it. All right. We're going to switch gears just a little bit now, Sal. Can you sing us a, a line from, from an Angry Humperdinck song? Humperdinck? Yeah. yeah. You got to give me tougher ones than that, pal. So I sing you to sleep after the loving with a song I just wrote yesterday. And I hope you can hear what the words and the music have to say after the loving. Yeah, you know, that's my mom's, like one of my mom and dad's, that was one of their favorite songs, not the favorite, but one of the favorites, yeah. I sing it all the time, I do, I sing it all the time. Yeah, that's a great song. All right, so how about sing us, sing us uh, something from your favorite Frankie Valley song. Frankie Valley, let's see, oh, I have so many. My eyes have told you Though I never laid a hand on you. Rosie, my eyes have taught you. Like a million miles away from me, you couldn't see how I have taught you. So close, so close, yet you're in Pennsylvania. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. All right, I've got one. What's your most requested song? And can you sing a little bit of whatever that is for us? Um, I get a lot of requests, but however, the one song that I get most requests for is not a Sinatra tune. Um, it's, it was made famous by a group called Jay Black and the Americans. It's called Caramia. Ka and and uh, it's been my calling card now for 20 years. And I never really liked them. I never liked Jay Black and the Americans. I never liked Caramia. But uh, uh, a girl who owned a restaurant that I sang for 20 years ago begged me to learn the song because she loved it so much. So I told her, all right, I like it, so I'll learn the song. And it's been my calling card ever since. Because in, in the song, there are certain parts where you, you really get the belt. And also, you, I, I, there's a falsetto in there, which I hit pretty good. So it's called Cower Me. I mean, that's the, that's the song. Cower Me, oh, why must we say goodbye? And then it goes from there. Well, sing a little more, and we want to hear some of the falsetto. Oh, could I hit the falsetto today? Um, Darling, hear my prayer. Cut a me affair, I'll be your love till the end of time. Bravissimo. I know I went out of key there, but what, what the hell? Oh, Sal, you're fantastic. You know that. You nailed that, it. This has been so much fun. You know, you have such a positive outlook on life. Every time I say, Sal, how are you doing? I'm great. You're like my dad. Every time I asked him, he was always like, I'm great. Like he doesn't, didn't focus on anything negative. What is your philosophy or how do you stay so upbeat? And what, what advice could you give people to keep, help them to stay upbeat? Um, did we stump you? <laughs> no, no. In other words, I, I, I go back on some of the things from my younger life. And uh, let's just put it like this. I mean, I certainly wasn't an angel my whole life. So I had a couple of brushes with 
I don't want to say near death experience, but things could have happened along that way. And they didn't. So uh, when things don't hurt you like that, they simply make you stronger. And uh, so that's why moving forward, even through the pandemic, even my son got very mad at me at one point because he thought I wasn't respecting the virus and that I was doing my, my regular routine and I didn't stop. And he wanted me to be more careful. And I said, Sal, you should know me better than that. I refused to lay down for something like that. Um, I'm going to live my life. And it's not that I'm going to go out and cough on people or have people cough on me. When I need to, I put a mask on. But I'm certainly not going to allow that to stop me from living my life. Okay? Because you got to keep pushing forward no matter what the circumstances are. And it only makes you stronger. And uh, because just the thought, of me not being able to sing. If, if I didn't do what I did during the pandemic, I would have been lost because I, could, I wouldn't be able to reach people. So because of what I did, and I never think of myself, I'm always thinking about others first. I know it sounds kind of, it's, it's, it's not self-serving at all. I, I, I'm, I'm talking from my heart. I, I, I worry about others before, way before I worry about me. So. Um, the thousands of, of messages that I got over the past six months from people thanking me that they needed to hear me every night through this thing, that they were so depressed and worried about so many people and worried about people dying, that they felt that I was this, this breath of fresh air that came into their lives every night. And I, I've gotten many thank yous and, 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 and I'm humbled by the experience. I, I really am. I appreciate it all. And I thank everyone. Um, and I'm touched, touches my heart. So I know this is what I have to do. You got to keep pushing forward. You got to keep doing what you have to do. And you can't allow much to get in your way. Especially when you know you're doing the right thing. Sal, that's great advice. Uh, it really is. And I, I have one other quick question for you, though. Um, if we were to have you on the show again in the future, do you think maybe next time, you know, you sang a song to Rosie, you think maybe you could sing one to me? You got a better shot of hitting Lotto, Bob Dylan. <laughs> better shot of hitting yes. the Lotto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as, as Rosie has said a couple times, there aren't very many times when I'm speechless, that's another one. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Sal. It doesn't happen often. <laughs> <laughs> this is wonderful, uh, what you're doing. Wonderful. Oh, my gosh. Well, it, what makes it wonderful is having people like you on the show, because I'm going to tell you something. We've been humbled by the amazing people that we've met. Now, you know, I've known you a long time, and you still surprise me because it goes so deep with you. And not that it surprises me, I mean, but it's just, it, I'm, I, I have a lot of ad, ad, admiration. Just got to, I appreciate that, Rosie, you know that. Uh, uh, you're a sweetheart. Uh, we'll be friends forever. And uh, whatever I can do to help, I'll be there. Simple as that. Likewise, likewise. And we, Sal, we really appreciate you coming on the show. And, and I think it's, it's easy to see how you've made a difference for so many, like you said, the thousands of messages, the gifts, all the things you've done to help people truly have made a difference. And at the end of each episode, I ask those watching to make a difference. You've done it. I want to thank you for it. So folks like Sal has done for so many for so long, make a difference every day. And make every day a great day. Thank you so much for watching. Best of luck to you, Sal, and we'll see you next week. That's wonderful. Bye, guys. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Rosie.